So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about a very vicious murder from New York. The aftermath of this murder is one of the most brutal I think I've ever covered on this channel. But what's characteristic about this particular murder were the sick and twisted games that the murderer played with the victim's parents, the victim's family, in the aftermath of the murder. But before we get into that, before we get into this case, I just wanna thank Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video and making this video possible. Function of Beauty, you guys know, is the only brand I ever use for hair care products, the only brand that I trust with my hair. They formulate their products specifically for your hair type and your hair needs, so every product they make is unique to you. All you have to do is fill out a quick two minute quiz on their website, tell them what kind of things you Want to improve about your hair so I always improve like the hydration, deep condition, volumize. You choose the colours, the scent, the strength of the scent and of course the name that goes on the bottle. Most recently I chose the new limited edition scent Isn't She Bubbly? It's like a champagne and citrus scent and it's amazing. I can't wait to wash my hair again. Of course I use their shampoo and conditioner every single time I wash my hair but in between washes I also use the hair serum which Oh my god, it makes my hair so smooth. It keeps the scent in my hair as well, which I love. And you can customize that too. They also do like hair masks, leave-in conditioners. Again, all customizable. Function of Beauty are 100% vegan and cruelty-free. They have no toxins, no parabens, no sulfates, and no GMOs. I've been using them and recommending them to you guys for well over a year now. So if you do want to try them out, make sure you're going through my link in the description to get 20% off of your first set. Thanks again to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into the case. But before we do, I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I cover in this case. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. Rebecca Costa, more affectionately known as Becky, was born on June 12th, 1985. In 2009, she was 24 years old, living in Medford in Long Island, New York with her mother Barbara and her stepfather Larry. Rebecca worked as a home healthcare aide so she would go to the homes of like the elderly and disabled and kind of make sure that they were washed, that they'd gotten dressed, that they'd taken their medication. She just helped people from their homes. She was a very confident, very social girl. Her best friend, Nicole Longo, was quoted saying that she was bubbly, lively, and loved everyone and everything. Rebecca's mother, Barbara, said that it was very rare that Rebecca would have a bad day. She was just such a positive, such a smiley girl. She was such a fun-loving girl as well. Her uncle said that this would rub off onto the people that she hung around with. Like, if you were hanging around with Rebecca, you knew that you were gonna have a good day because she just, she just made it happen. She was just, a good energy. Rebecca loved going to bars, she loved going on nights out, she loved dancing, she had a lot of friends, she was gorgeous, she got a lot of male attention as well, but none of that really mattered to her because she actually had a boyfriend. She'd been with this man a few months, 28 year old Dan Mayer. And that is exactly who she was with on December 3rd, 2009. Rebecca went out with her boyfriend Dan, her best friend Nicole, and a bunch of other friends. They went to two different bars in Suffolk County, so not too far from where she actually lived and they were just having a great night. They were dancing, they were drinking, they'd done this so many times. Around 3.30 a.m. all the bars on that kind of strip began closing and so the group decided to call it a night and go home. Rebecca shared a house with her mother and her mother actually worked as a nurse on the night shift. And so when Rebecca went home that night, she was going home to an empty house. So her group decided that she would be one of the first to be dropped off so that they could make sure she got home safe. And they did, they dropped her off, she got inside safe. She texted her mother, Barbara, just letting her know that she was home and that she was about to go to bed. Because her mother, her mother Barbara worried a lot about her. She always wanted her to text and update her, let her know that she'd got home safe, as many mothers do. And so she did, she texted her mother saying that she was home. Her mother received this text at work and that was the last time that anyone would actually hear from Rebecca Costa. When Barbara arrived home from her shift the following morning, everything seemed normal at the house. Everything seemed fine. Rebecca's car was still in the driveway. Everything was still in place. All of Rebecca's things were still there but there was just no sign of 
Rebecca herself. So Barbara tries calling her, she tries texting her, but she receives no response. Thinking that she'd probably just spent the night either at her boyfriend's or one of her friends, she decides to just go to sleep, you know, as she often did when she got home from the night shift. However, when she woke up a few hours later and there were still no responses to the texts or the calls, Rebecca still wasn't home, Barbara started to get really worried. She went into Rebecca's room and realised that her work uniform was actually still in there and so was her pocketbook. And so she knew that Rebecca hadn't come home to get changed for work or take her work things, meaning that she hadn't shown up at work that day, which was totally unlike Rebecca. So Barbara called Rebecca's boyfriend, Dan, and just asked if she was there with him or if he knew where she was. And he said, oh no, I, I dropped her off last night at 3.30. I thought she texted you. And she had, Rebecca had texted her mother saying that she was home and that she was about to go to bed. And that was the last time anyone saw her, her boyfriend, her friends, when they dropped her off that night, that was the last time they saw her. So what had happened? since she sent that text message. So Barbara wasted no time getting in contact with police and reporting Rebecca Costa as missing. So police immediately went and interviewed all of the people that last saw her, which was her boyfriend, her best friend, Nicole, all of her other friends that they were out with that night. But again, they all said the same thing. The last time they saw her was when they dropped her off at home around 3.30 that night and they hadn't seen or heard from Rebecca since. So while police got to work on the case investigating, her friends and family decided to go out manually searching for Rebecca. They all split up into teams and went to all of the places that Rebecca went to often. So the places she would go walking, her favorite food places. Some family members even stayed at home creating and printing off missing persons posters. They went round knocking on doors in the area, handing out these posters, asking anyone if they'd seen or heard of Rebecca, but nothing really came up. They asked all the neighbours to keep an eye out for her anyway, just hoping that maybe she would turn back up at home, maybe she'd gone somewhere, met up with someone, and then she was going to come home naturally. Meanwhile, her family had found this phone tracker service online, and they were trying to track her phone, but she wasn't using it, and you can only see when people are currently on the phone and she wasn't using it, so that was no help. They received a few general locations where she'd been kind of in the last few days, but that wasn't any help either. And all of this, the way that her friends and family reacted just shows how out of character this was for Rebecca. It's not even been 24 hours and they're already making missing persons posters, trying to track her cell phone, like, Anyone's friends and family would be concerned if their family member went missing. However, this just shows that this was so unlike her that they knew something must have happened to her. Rebecca was always the type of person to keep her mother in the loop. As you can tell from when she got home that night when she was drunk, she was tired, it was 3.30 in the morning, but she still made sure to text her mother, letting her know that she was home safe. That's just the kind of girl that she was. And so the fact that she hadn't contacted anyone for 24 hours shows that this was serious. Something must have happened to her. So anyway, as all of these searches are going on, police are doing their best to look into Rebecca's last known movements. So they know that she went to two bars that night. And while the group said that they didn't stay at the second bar for very long, that was the last place that Rebecca was kind of in public, if that makes sense. So if anyone was to see her, if she was to meet up with anyone, speak to anyone, you know, they, they might get clues from looking in the last public place that she went. So police went to that bar, they interviewed some staff and they were actually able to collect some CCTV footage from that night. This CCTV footage, unfortunately, is in public footage. So I can't put it in this video. However, I do have some quotes from people and a bit of an explanation as to what police saw. So they see Rebecca in the CCTV footage. She's dancing, she's having fun, she's drinking with her friends as they expected her to be. However, there was one section of CCTV footage that police were particularly interested in. So at one point, Rebecca goes to the bar to go and order a drink. She's by herself. She left all the friends over where they were sitting. And while she's at the bar, she gets talking to this guy and they're talking for a while. They're kind of obviously visually flirting. And at one point she actually gives this guy her phone 
so that he can type something in and then he gives it back to her. So police concluded that he was probably putting his number in her phone. And this opened up a whole new line of searching. Who was this man? Had something happened with this man? What had he been saying to her? You know, had she possibly planned to meet up with him? after she went home and maybe that's why he gave her the number, who knows. So police went and spoke with her friends and her boyfriend and stuff and asked them if they knew who this man was. They showed them the CCTV footage and none of them had seen this man before, none of them knew his name. So they couldn't really help police there. It seemed as though this was quite a secretive thing with Rebecca since she did have a boyfriend and you know, she was with him that night at the bar. It wasn't like she was gonna go get this man's number at the bar and then run back over to her friends and be like, oh, look, I got this guy's number. She she kept that a secret when she went back. So police set about trying to trace this man from the bar. However, this was gonna be pretty hard since no one, no one knew him, no one knew his name, no one had seen his face before. It was gonna be hard to track him. So as police were faced with this seemingly impossible task, the searches continued with her family. They were going out night and day, still giving out posters, still knocking on doors. And then three days into the search, Barbara receives a text and it's from Rebecca. And in this text, Rebecca claimed that she was being held captive by her boyfriend, Dan, saying that she didn't know where she was and she was scared and she needed help. So Barbara said that she panicked. She tried calling Rebecca on her phone, knowing that she was on her phone. However, Rebecca didn't answer. And when she didn't, Barbara decided to call 911. As soon as she got off the phone with 911, she called pretty much everyone that was out searching for Rebecca, friends, family, everyone, updating them on this text that she received. And she told them all to head straight over to Dan Mayer's house. And so they all turned up pretty much all at once. And when they did, Police were out on Dan's drive already interviewing him. Police went in and searched his home. They searched his basement, his bedroom, every single wardrobe, closet he had, but there was no sign of Rebecca. Although police weren't convinced that he was innocent just yet. Maybe Rebecca wasn't in his home, but after all, he was one of the last people to see her alive that night. Potentially the last if he'd gone up to her house with her to kind of kiss her goodnight. And she did say in the text to her mother that she didn't know where she was and that she was scared. You know, it wouldn't make sense if she was at Dan's house because she'd been there before. She she would know where she was. So there's always the possibility that maybe he'd taken her somewhere else to keep her hostage. Maybe Dan had gotten jealous that night. Maybe he somehow saw or found out that she'd been flirting with other guys at the bar. Maybe she he found out that she'd got this other guy's number. And so that gives a potential motive as to why he might want to do this, why he might want to hurt her. Barbara said that she didn't even know what to think at this point. She trusted Dan and she knew how much her daughter loved Dan, but you know, they'd only been dating for a few months. So how much did they really know this man? Was he capable of doing something like this to her daughter? All of the evidence so far seem to have been pointing to Dan and now they have Rebecca herself saying that she's being held captive by Dan. And then just a few hours after that first text, Barbara receives another text from Rebecca, this time saying that Dan had her chained up in a basement. The text even said at the end in capital letters, don't tell Dan or he'll kill me. Like I said earlier, Rebecca's friends and family had been trying to track her cell phone on this kind of online cell phone tracker service. And they can only get a location when she's on her phone and when she's active. So when she's either sending calls or sending texts, and now they had that. Now she just sent a text so they could track her location. They located the phone to be around 20 miles away in a place called Cormac in New York. And so the family jumped in the car and went straight there thinking that Rebecca was being held captive there. However, this, this kind of locator service didn't give a specific location, just a kind of general area. And so once the family got to Cormac, they didn't really know what to do. They went round banging on every single door they could, handing out all the posters, asking if anyone had seen or heard anything. They were running up and down the streets, screaming Rebecca's name, but ultimately they got nothing out of it. No one had seen her, no one had heard from her. But by now, her family is starting to think, well, hold on. Rebecca's a very smart girl. If she has access to a phone, why is she using it to text her mother and not 
to call 911 and save herself. It's not even like she's texting her mother and asking her mother to call 911 on her behalf. You know, maybe she's in a situation where she can't call 911, she can't talk, but she's not even asking her mother to do that in these texts. To them, it didn't make sense. It was almost as if these texts weren't Rebecca. You know, Rebecca, Rebecca had a lot more to her than these texts, you know, she would be trying to save herself. But regardless, they were holding on hope that maybe this was Rebecca and maybe she was just so distressed that she wasn't in a place to think about what she was doing. Although this didn't quite seem like it was her. Barbara and her friends even went to psychics at this point. It had been a few days since Rebecca went missing. And all of these psychics were saying to Barbara that your daughter's alive. She's just in a dark place at the moment, but she'll be back safe and sound very soon. But within a day or two of these psychic visits, the Costa family received the news that they never wanted to receive. It was now six days after Rebecca had gone missing. However, five days prior to this, so the morning after she went missing, a body had been found around 85 miles away and it remained unidentified until now. The body was that of a young female and it was horrifically mutilated. And that was the exact reason why it had remained unidentified for so long because forensics just couldn't, they couldn't identify this body. And especially because it was found so far away. It was actually found in a whole other state. It was found in Connecticut over 80 miles away. And so this was a whole other police force that was dealing with this, this Jane Doe. Police over there weren't aware of Rebecca or her disappearance and so they hadn't made that connection. So police called Rebecca's mother, Barbara, and they told her that they had some bad news. And all she could say was just, no, don't say it, don't say it. But this body was finally identified as that of 24 year old Rebecca Costa. The autopsy showed that she'd been stabbed multiple times to death, the fatal wound being one straight through her liver. Her body had been horrifically mutilated, like I said, but in a way that it was obvious what her killer was trying to do. Her killer was trying to make sure that her body wouldn't be identified. All her fingertips were severed, her toes as well. Her killer had even cut out chunks of her skin where she had tattoos. Of course, tattoos are a huge thing in being able to identify bodies that are otherwise unidentifiable. But worst of all, her killer had even tried to cut her whole face off. Her nose, her ears, anything kind of identifiable about her face, they'd severed it all. Some sources even say that Rebecca Costa was beheaded. I'm not sure if they're referring to her face being cut off. I can't completely confirm whether she was beheaded or not. Whatever was left of her body was then wrapped in blankets and plastic bags and transported to a random field on the side of a highway in Connecticut, covered in flammable liquid and set alight. And that was the final step for her murderer to make sure that nothing of her body was identifiable or, you know, could possibly trace back to them themselves, the killer, that there was no forensics, no fingerprints, no DNA left on Rebecca. However, there was one thing that the killer forgot about when trying to make sure that Rebecca was unidentifiable and that was her teeth. Her dental records were the thing that were able to identify her in the end. Immediately following her body being found, all of her friends and family just assumed that it was Dan Mayer, assumed that it was her boyfriend and they just thought that he was gonna be arrested and that was how this was gonna go. You know, he was the last to see her alive. All of the text messages from Rebecca herself incriminated Dan, said that Dan was the one that was doing this to her. And besides, there was a potential motive. Like I said, he might have seen her flirting with this guy at the bar. But despite all of this suspicion building up against Dan Mayer, police ruled him out as a suspect entirely. They said that this wasn't him, he was completely innocent, and they were looking elsewhere for a suspect. Which left the family thinking, well, if this wasn't Dan, who could it be? They couldn't think of anyone else that that knew Rebecca, that could have done this to her, that could have got her out of her house 
in the middle of the night to do this to her. There were no signs of a break-in on the house, so it wasn't like she was abducted. It didn't seem as though she was abducted. Well, police were actually already on to their next suspect at this point in the case. They'd been able to get in contact with Rebecca's phone network company. They hadn't been able to locate her phone, but they could get in touch with her network and asked to see her phone records. And they found that after she'd been dropped off at home that night by her friends and by Dan, and after she'd texted her mother, letting her know that she was home safe, she'd actually taken two phone calls. One of the phone calls was actually over 17 minutes long, so she was spending a while talking to this person, and police were able to trace this phone call and the person that was calling her. And police found that this phone number belonged to a 33 year old man. This man was named Evans Ganthia. They asked Rebecca's friends and family if they'd heard of him or seen him or met him before, but none of them had any idea who he was. But as soon as police saw this man's face, they knew exactly who he was. This was the man that was seen giving his number to Rebecca on CCTV at the bar that night. So police immediately went to arrest Evan Scanthia and they brought him in for an interview, but he denied everything. He said, yes, he met her in the bar that night, but he hadn't seen her since. He had nothing to do with this. He didn't even know that she'd gone missing or that she was found dead. And you know, while this did look really bad for him, police didn't have any you know, specific evidence to say that he'd done this to her, maybe this was an unfortunately timed phone call. And so they had to let him go until they could find concrete evidence that he'd actually harmed Rebecca. Before they let him go from the police station, they actually took a DNA swab from him so that they could test it against any evidence that they found, you know, on Rebecca, on the things that she was wrapped in when she was killed. Police pretty much knew that this guy had to be the guy, but they just needed that that concrete physical evidence. They needed, you know, a fingerprint or some blood or some DNA, fibers, anything. And so while they waited for that DNA evidence to come back, they actually decided to obtain search warrants, both for Ganthia's house, his garage, and his car. In his house, they didn't find anything really, anything at all. However, when they went in his garage, they noticed that it had a very strong bleach smell and it seemed immaculately clean as if it had just been scrubbed meticulously, which people don't often do in their garages. You know, garages are sometimes dirty. It's where you keep your car. It's not, you know, it's not the most clean place in your house. But it was when they searched his SUV that they realized that this had to be the guy. There was blood everywhere all over this car, particularly pulled under the passenger seat. So Ganthia was brought back to the police station for questioning and to be confronted with the results of this search. And it just so happened that around the time that he was brought back in, the results of the DNA test came back. And finally, police had their concrete piece of evidence. One of Evans Ganthia's fingerprints was found on the duct tape that was wrapped around Rebecca Costa's body. So now police had enough evidence to arrest and charge Evans Ganthia, but first they wanted to present him with all of this evidence that they had and see if he could explain it, see if he could defend himself, see what he would say when presented with this. Would he just confess? So in this second interview, you know, he couldn't really deny it at this point. And so Evans Ganthia admitted that he had called Rebecca that night and they had planned to meet up. They arranged for her to spend the night at his place and so he drove down to her house, picked her up and they drove back to his house. He said that everything was fine on their way there. However, around the time that they arrived back at his house, Rebecca started feeling very unwell. She was coughing, she was foaming at the mouth. He said that she was very dizzy, she was lightheaded, she was still wearing her high heels and she tripped over one of his gym weights in his garage. He said he bent down to try to, you know, look after her, care for her after she'd just tripped and he realized that she was unconscious. Evans Ganthia quickly concluded that Rebecca Costa was dead. And he said that he began panicking at this point. He thought that his only option was to mutilate her body beyond recognition so that she could never be identified and try to dispose of her body. Because he thought 
if he was to contact police or get an ambulance or something, this would be pinned on him. You know, they would think that he killed her. So immediately he got to work. He began severing all the parts of her body that he thought could identify her. So all of her fingers, all of her toes, parts of her body that had tattoos on them, her nose, her ears, and then he wrapped her body in blankets, in plastic bags, and then loaded it into the trunk of his car. He said he drove to a ferry port close by to where he lived in Long Island and got a ferry all the way over to Connecticut. He then drove his car out into Connecticut until he found, you know, a large field on the side of a highway. He packed up his car and dragged her body out into the middle of this field. He then covered the body in a flammable liquid, set it on fire, went and got back in his car and went back home to clean his garage, get rid of any evidence that he could. But of course, police didn't really believe this story. I mean, they did, but they didn't believe that it was an accident. They believed that he had done all the severing and stuff like that and taken the body out on a ferry, but they didn't believe that this was an accident and that she got ill and then she tripped over a gym wear. Evan Scanthia was actually seen on the ferry CCTV footage just walking around. It was one of those ferries where you can just drive your car on and park it and then go up into the ferry and, you know, go to the shops and whatever. And he was just walking around as if he didn't have a dead body in the back of his car. He just didn't seem panicked at all, you know, but that's what he said he was. He said that this girl had just died in his company and he, he was terrified. He thought that this was gonna be pinned on him. But you know, he looks so calm in this CCTV footage as if, you know, nothing had just happened. This did seem planned to a degree. So of course there was no way for him to plan this all in advance because he didn't know he was gonna run into Rebecca in the bar that night. Although it did seem as though he thought about how to hide a body before, how to dispose of a body, how to make sure that it wasn't be, gonna be identified. Police theorized that Evan Scanthia murdered Rebecca Costa in his car because, you know, there was so much blood in there and it seemed to pool under the passenger seat and in the middle bit, kind of where the cup holders are and stuff. It seemed as though he'd stabbed her while she was still in his car. They then believe that he carried her body into his garage where he began the mutilation process. The motive is still a mystery. No one knows what his motive was that night. Why had he done this? Was it possible that he was expecting to get sex from Rebecca that night and maybe she'd changed her mind on the way to his house or maybe she'd kind of put it out there that she wasn't gonna do that tonight and maybe he flipped? Or had Evan Scanthia been planning to kill her all along? Had he taken her number in the club that night with that intention? Had he texted her and called her, planning to meet up with her, planning to take her back to his house with the intention of killing her. That would explain why he knew what he was gonna do step by step. It seemed he did this, carried out this whole thing relatively intelligently as well. Yes, he did get caught, but he thought about a lot of things in the process. Maybe he'd thought about this in detail before and he knew that he wanted to kill someone, but he was just waiting for a victim to present themselves. And maybe that was what Rebecca Costa was that night. But the sickest part about this whole case were those texts that Ganthea was sending to Rebecca's panicked and grieving mother, making her believe that her daughter was still alive out there somewhere, that they had hope of bringing her home safe and sound. This man, Evan Ganthea, seemed truly sick. Even if his story was true, that Rebecca died accidentally in his company, what was the purpose of those text messages? What was the, why, why did he need to do that? Ganthea really was a twisted individual. He was found guilty of second degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 25 years. He'll be eligible for parole in about 15 years in 2035. Rebecca's mother, Barbara, has since campaigned for young people to think twice before trusting strangers. One night stands and things of that nature are always a risk when you don't know the person or when you barely know the person. There's safe ways to have fun and then there's unsafe ways to have fun. You need to make sure that someone knows where you are at all times. Try to stick with a friend at all times on nights out. Think twice before you trust 
anyone that you kind of meet in a club or a bar. You don't know who's safe to trust out there. You don't know what their intentions are. In the moment, you might think it's a good idea, but, you know, nothing is worth this. Nothing is worth your life ending any degree like Rebecca Costas did. But that is all I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. Thank you so, so much to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video. If you want to try out their amazing hair care, amazing body care, they are very kindly offering you guys 20% off when you go through my link down below in the description. Huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you want to become a channel member, you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a thumbs up down below, click here to subscribe to my channel and click here to subscribe to my brand new second channel, woo! Um, and click here if you wanna watch another video from me. Bye!